uh, uh, first, um, um, Tocqueville talks about how to temper the democratic tyranny. And, and what does America do? And he gives three things. He says, uh, we have decentralized administration. So um, um, the, the, the central government makes decisions on politics, but how to administer those, those decisions is often left up to uh, local or state governments. So, um, and, uh, and this, he thinks, is, is very good because it means that there isn't this central direction from one source, from the capital, over everything. And there's uh, an ability to, to adjust to local conditions and to ask local people what they think. Then he mentions lawyers. Lawyers are a kind of aristocratic body. Lawyers believe in the importance of forms because that's what you learn in law school. You learn about legal forms, the legal way to do things, and the importance of having a legal way to do things, and technicalities, why those, uh, they seem to get in the way, but actually they help you live, because otherwise uh, you can't you know, respect everybody's rights, say, if in a courtroom there aren't formalities which assure that both sides can be heard. So, um, so lawyers uh, are a kind of aristocratic, democra democratic aristocracy. Democratic because anybody can be a lawyer. You don't have to be from a noble family. Uh, and, there, and of course today everybody is a lawyer in America. It's a very litigious country. And then a third thing that it temper that uh, the majority, the tyranny of the majority is juries, serving on a jury. Now, now when, when you serve on a jury, you see the law, which is a very general thing, applied to one person okay, or one group. And that means that you learn to question uh, the uh, justice or the applicability of a general proposition to an individual case. So, um, it, and it becomes your task to decide how to apply this law to the individual case. And, you, and, and that makes you responsible for thinking about, say, it's a murder. And so uh, you have to think about what, what is it that makes people murder other people. And, and, and you see how bad it is. But does, is this person guilty? And also, uh, how guilty is it? I mean, you, all these thoughts go into your mind as you're deciding whether to send him, uh, someone else to jail or not. And it makes you feel responsible because the choice is up to you. For once, you get a choice. And so Tocqueville has this high words of praise for the jury. Of, uh, it's a, a great free school of democracy. Free in the sense of it's free of charge. No, no tuition payment. And uh, they, in fact, they demand that you come. So you listen. Learn, republics go wrong when they try to pass too many laws. This is, uh, republics are dominated by legislatures. And when a legislature legislator hears something or sees something bad, some event occurs. His first idea is to, let's pass a law. And everybody wants, joins in with that. There's, in, in, in republics or democracies, there's a kind of passion for passing laws. But when you're on the jury, you see that laws are questionable. Yes, we need them and so on, but sometimes uh, it's, it's very hard to apply them, just, justly. And yet, uh, you don't want to make an exception either and say, this person is above the law. We are, I feel sorry for him. So then, but then he comes uh, to uh, the uh, tyranny of the majority. And that is uh, um, in, uh, where are we? 
in chapter 7. The omnipotence of the majority. We've been building up to this. Okay? Over the majority, over all representative forms. It's the theory of equality, he says, applied to brains or intellects. The moral empire of the majority. Mm. Is that, um, it's all very well to say that each, each person has his own reason, sufficient to run his own life, but in fact you're subject to the majority. As I said, when you think you're equal, you look around and you find nobody who deserves to be in authority over you. But on the other hand, everybody is just like you, similar to you, sometimes. Tocqueville says. And so you begin to say, well, uh, what are other people thinking? So you don't know what you think, and you look around, well, what, what does everyone else think? And so everyone else is the majority. And so uh, it, instead of having a, a strict guide which you believe in, and which gives your individual life a certain character, you begin to waver and become and you start conforming to what most people think. Because most people are like you, and all of us are equal. And so why should you be better than most people? So you begin to think that the majority is always right. And the, and the majority develops this empire, moral empire over everyone. That, that it must be right what most people think. And you see in polls, that's the power of polls. <laughs> and, um, every, people are thinking this. People, the polls now say same-sex marriage is okay. So, hmm, they must be right. That's a change. Yeah. Conform. So this is what he means by the tyranny of the majority. And uh, it's already, he's saying, it's a kind of tyranny within the mind. It isn't only uh, uh, as to, uh, um, uh, it, it, is, it isn't only as to actions. And so he speaks of the majority having power over thought in Americans. Is on, let me read you a bit. On page 244. I do not know any country where in general less independence of mind and genuine freedom of discussion reign than in America. That's a really tough statement. <laughs> if, if you're an American, it's hard to hear that. But he's referring to this uh, the conformity of the power of the majority in a, in a democratic country like America. So uh, let me now go to the races and the racial question. Because the biggest, and the most obvious example of the tyranny of the majority is uh, slavery, or was slavery in the time uh, Tocqueville was here. So there's this very long chapter, almost 100 pages long, which is a kind of uh, book by itself, within a book. It's the only chapter that has its own structure, in which he tells you uh, topics that he's going to treat. The three races say whites, uh, reds, and blacks. Say the uh, Asians weren't there yet. <laughs> they, they came later, well not too much later, I think the Chinese came and uh, uh, build, building railroads in the middle of the 19th century. Here's how he talks about this. The white is, is man par excellence, the European. It's a combination of his race and his civilization. And that means uh, man as distinct from an animal. He, because uh, a European with a civilization is able to use uh, other human beings and animals. Man is over nature. He tyrannizes over the Indians and the blacks, whom he, whom he calls unfortunate races. Not inferior, but unfortunate. Um, in other words, there were racial theories in those, in those days, and one friend of Tocqueville's name, Gobineau, had a theory of races that uh, Tocqueville disliked very much. 
and uh, he wrote long letters to his friend uh, objecting to this racist theory. But um, he gives this uh, description of uh, blacks and the Indians. Each of them sort of represents one human element. And uh, first he says, let's look, uh, page 304 of blacks. Um, the Negro has no family. He cannot see in woman anything but the passing companion of his pleasures and his sons by being born are his equals. Plunged into this abyss of evils, the Negro hardly feels his misfortune. Violence had placed him in slavery. The habit of servitude has given him the thoughts and ambition of a slave. He admires his tyrants more than he hates them, and he finds his joy and his pride in servile imitation of those who oppress him. So the blacks are deprived of the privileges of humanity and made to think of themselves as the possession of someone else. You know, they have no self-responsibility and therefore no pride except in the servile imitation of whites. They, they, they do what the whites do or try to do that. Um, and that's, but that's habit. It's not their nature, it's not because they can't do more, it's just their habit. So they're incapable of freedom. Their desires are not subject to reason. Slavery brutalizes a black fellow. And freedom would lead to destruction because he wouldn't know how to live freely. So this is the extreme of slavery that the blacks in America were suffering. Whereas the Indians had an extreme freedom. They are the total opposite of the blacks. They have a barbarous, barbarous independence. So the behavior of these two subject races is quite different, altogether different, quite the opposite. The black tries to integrate and to join society, white society. He would like to be very much like the whites, but they reject him, whereas the Indians have no thought. They're, they're disdainful of the whites. They do not want to integrate into uh, white man's civilization. They want to stay away from it or get away as far as they can. Um, the Indian has myths about his origins. He pretends to be noble and therefore above the white, the happy hunting grounds, his own gods, his religion, you know, tells them that the Indians are the are are the rulers of, of, of the earth. In, in, uh, so in some you'll get, this is how he describes it, uh, the Negro would like to intermingle with the European and he cannot. The Indian could up to a certain point succeed at it, but he disdains the attempt. The servility of the one delivers him to slavery and the pride of the other to death. And he goes on, uh, to, uh, um, to discuss uh, blacks and reds at uh, considerable length. Um, in order, I think, to give a, a lesson or teach us a lesson on the relationship between pride and liberty, or pride and freedom. The European is man par excellence because he can use nature and so he submits himself, his desires, to reason and law. And that requires pride in your own being. And also no illusions about your origin. <coughs> that you're a, a divine ruler. It requires knowledge of man's place in nature. The Indians' illusion, uh, illusions about nobility, their ancestors, give them great pride. Therefore, they're very free. See? But he can't preserve himself because he can't control himself. He can't live in a civilized society. Right? And the terrible uh, problem of the Indians always was drink, fi fire water, as they called it. So the whites were able to control them by giving them whiskey to drink. And, uh, 
it, it totally uh, ruined um, the, the the independence of the uh, of the Indian, and they couldn't live even. Whereas the black can preserve himself because he imitates the whites, but he has no dignity. His dignity would only be in liberating himself from slavery. And there was a black man, Frederick Douglass, at the very time uh, Tocqueville was writing, who escaped from slavery. This was 1831, and who wrote uh, his autobiography. It came out in 1845, some, somewhat later. So Tocqueville couldn't read it about uh, how he learned how to read. His master wouldn't let him read. That's Tocqueville mentions. See, that the masters won't let the blacks read. Why? Because they're afraid of what they'll learn. But if they're afraid of what they learn, they must be human beings, capable of learning. If you're capable of learning, see, why shouldn't you be allowed to be free? So these white masters who did this uh, were, in, were contradicting themselves, their, their principle that the blacks were inferior. No, they were afraid that they weren't inferior. That was their problem. So, that, so they, they had to suppress them even more. So the Indians were too proud. They should have destroyed the Europeans when they first arrived. But they were too optimistic, too confident, didn't see the danger to their way of civilization. Their civilization depended on game. They were hunters. Everything in Indian society depended on hunting and gathering. And so um, they weren't farmers. So they, they weren't civilized enough. So they depended on deer and game and uh, so the, the, uh, the, the civilization of the whites <coughs> was always too noisy. And as soon as the civilization came uh, close, the uh, game ran away. And the Indians had to go with wherever the game was. And after a while, they ran out of places to go. So it wasn't really possible for the Indian civilization and the white civilization to coexist. Whereas it was possible for the whites and blacks to coexist if the whites had been willing to integrate instead of enslave. So that's Tocqueville's analysis of this. There are questions on this very big problem. He thought that um, uh, there, a civil war might come, but he thought it would be between the blacks and the whites and not, between, not within the whites. Uh, between the South and the North, as it happened. So he didn't expect Abraham Lincoln, you could say, <laughs> as, a, as a person who could rally the North to abolish slavery. So the first uh, African American, when they came to the US, they came to the US as slaves, and they came to the US as slaves. Yes. And so their culture, they lost their culture in English. That's right. And so their culture is not independent, so they have to join the white people. Sure. Yes. But Indian people have their culture. Yes. They can, like, I'm they could. <laughs> they, they did. They tried. But their culture was, uh, it was impossible to coexist with white, the civilization of the whites. So they would have to become. Um, like the whites and abandon their culture. And how could they do that and not become slaves? Even now, it's still a problem. Because they live on uh, reservations, and if you talk to them, they sound like other Americans, but they still have the problem about drinking, and, they're, and they have a kind of special status. So they're not subject to all the taxes they fight in the armies. When I was in the army, my ca captain was, a, was an Indian, big man. We all loved him. So, uh, so that's, and the blacks, that's, that, of course, as you know, is still a problem too, although I think much less. And it's a question too for the so-called multiculturalism. Is it possible 
for all cultures to live together. And it seems, uh, according to Tocqueville's analysis, it's not. You couldn't have uh, the Indians as real Indians. Um, and possibly you couldn't have the blacks as real blacks in, in, as they were in Africa with their own culture. But they, 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 uh, they so there's this phrase, you know, African American. So they, they call it back, they look back to that to some extent. But um, if you've been to Africa, you would see a big difference between a black American and a real, an African American and a real African. Yeah, do you think that so-called white privilege or the, the U.S. in general, because of so-called trouble is made by so many like blacks or Native Americans, is because they're not they're subject or they're not fit in the system and they're resisting and uh, resist resistance or something that they what? Oh my god. Uh wait. What is that? Uh no, okay. I'm okay. Yeah, no but the the main point is that uh, the, the blacks uh, are wanted to integrate. They didn't want to they didn't resist white man civilization. But they they couldn't, they were rejected. And, um, and this, um, uh, because it was uh, yeah, economically uh, and, uh, valuable to use them as slaves in the South. And that and the people uh, wrongly thought that they were somehow subhuman. And so Tocqueville talks about, too, the white, the prejudice of the white. Their black skin, they look very different. So you had the slavery in the Greeks, too, but there, it wasn't racial. So and, uh, it could be just uh, the, a neighboring city that uh, you, you defeated in war, so you make slaves of them. Or the Roman slaves, too, was the very same thing. But when, when you uh, combine slavery with race, and, and then, then it looks as if, and, and, you, and you think that blacks are ugly, and inferior, then it looks as if uh, um, the slavery is natural or justified, inherent, and uh, you, you, um, you dream up these bad ideas, which happened, uh, which happened here. <clears throat> well, as I say, the, the, in the North, uh, slavery was, uh, uh, was, was, was unpopular. And there were these. There was a movement. That's an example that uh, Tocqueville uses: an uh, abolitionist movement to abolish slavery, which was a popular movement. One of his associations, an example of a new association, a uh, political association uh, that had a, had, a, had a great effect, and eventually, uh, you could say, won. The problem in the North was that uh, they were uh, against, uh, opposed to slavery, but they weren't willing to fight to abolish it. I think I mentioned this. So you can be opposed to something, <laughs> and, but it was, a, it was another part of the country. You can be opposed to uh, all the people being killed in Syria right now, see? but uh, would you give your life to prevent it? Go over there and fight. So. But, see, the whites in the North were willing to give their lives for the Union. And so that's how Lincoln argued the Union. And then he, then he had this uh, extra argument. Uh, you're not going to have a Union unless it's either all free or, or, uh, or all slave. Question for actually previous parts, that is, how do you think that the supermajority rule will protect the minorities? Uh, how, how will it protect minorities? Yes. Supermajority, yeah. Uh, in other words, there's complication in the American Constitution. Uh, that, yeah, that, that's something we passed over. 
but yeah. Um, so um, the uh, the American founders thought that, uh, just as Tocqueville did, that the great problem of a democracy or of a republic is t is the tyranny of a majority. So uh, how do you solve that? Not, and the answer is not not by uh, denying the principle of majority rule, but by seeing to it that the majority will uh, most probably be moderate. Even, even you uh, use this phrase, super majority. So as if it were just another majority. But you could also say the super majority gives power to a minority. That, that's the real, that's the argument with a bite. Um, and uh, so, and, and the answer, the famous answer in number 10 Federalist is, uh, if the country is large and diverse, then uh, you have, in order to make a majority, you have to get different kinds of people in your party. And you see that with both the Democrats and the Republicans today. That they're both uh, coalitions. Uh, and when you're a coalition, then you won't be so extreme and you won't tyrannize over the minority. And say blacks. Blacks are a minority, but they are mostly mostly vote for the Democrats. And the Democrats are frequently a majority. They just won uh, the last election. So that means that even though you're a minority, you can be part of a winning majority. So that's a kind of cons consolation that can protect you. Yeah. In the old times, people are willing to sacrifice to get unity. Well, but why do you think it is harder and harder to see people who are willing to sacrifice themselves to get unity nowadays? It is easier to be divided than unity, for example, everywhere. What do you think the reason behind it? Uh, it's complicated, though. <laughs> uh, because nobody can be 100% for unity and nobody 100% for divided. <laughs> so every Every division is a kind of unity. <laughs> uh, that, um, in order to strengthen yourself, uh, if it's not just yourself, uh, you have to agree with other people uh, just to make a party, say, to make a division. And yet, on the other hand, uh, there's no, really, there is no, it doesn't seem that there's any human association which contains all human beings that's effective as a government. So, and that would have to be United Nations. The United Nations is not is much more a super majority than uh, it's, I mean it's very far from the principle of majority rule. And uh, who who wants to be ruled by I mean somebody from the other side of the world in a small country knows nothing about you. Already, it's bad enough you know, because your your uh, freedom is affected by other people. So uh, when the United States was founded, they, they 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 founded themselves as a people. So a people is a part of all human beings. And the, the principle of this part was all human beings are created equal. So that's always been a problem for America. How much? for all human beings and how much just for us. And it, and it doesn't seem that there's any country that people will agree to that isn't somehow just for us. So people don't like to be ruled by others, e even if it we're all the same. So uh, freedom or self-government seems to require to fighting yourself off from other peoples. Right. But then you still need to make, say, China, you still need to make all the Chinese live together and not collapse like as happened to the Soviet Union. So, uh, Professor Mesfield, I study Paris, and a friend of mine, also Chinese student, studying Paris, uh, heard I have the uh, I have a chance to actually attend your, uh, your lecture. You asked me to uh, deliver this question to you. Yes. As a very admirer of the Strauss School. 
So here's this, here's this question. Um, so as we know, you are leading Straw School political scientist, and I would like to know your thoughts of the relationship between political theory and the political reality, especially the relationship between political scientist and the public. Someone criticized that Strauss is elitist and anti-democratic, which would lead to authoritarianism. But someone else defends that political scientist should understand the complexity of political reality. Strauss mentioned uh, esoteric teaching and exoteric teaching. Uh, one side saying is for the highly educated, but the other side is for the preaching of the public. So what do you think of the noble lights? The noble lights, quote unquote. Uh, and there's a second, second question. <laughs> that one is bad enough. <laughs> uh, in the Chinese context, the Strauss School scholars are trying to use the Strauss theory to explain the Chinese reality. Uh, they are trying to bring back the Chinese uh, tradition to fight against liberalism. What do you think of this? Thanks. OK. Um, yeah, yes, I'm a. Uh, a friend or fo follower of uh, Leo Strauss, you could say, and certainly in the, in the Strauss school. Uh, but uh, I, I, know I, I would say uh, uh, my answer in general is read Tocqueville. Most Straussians don't like to give their opinions. They like to speak through the mouths of great writers. Because uh, uh, talk Tocqueville has, has thought a lot about and more successfully about these things than I can remember or tell you on my own. So uh, I would say uh, read this book if you want the answer to what, you know, whether noble lies are necessary. Or, for example, I was just talking about noble lies um, in, uh, uh, when we discussed doubt. That you have to tell yourself a noble lie you know, to, uh, in order to get, off, get out of bed in the morning. Stop philosophizing. Oh. Um, and um, uh, uh, the Strauss School is to some extent anti-democratic because it thinks that uh, it isn't 100% true that all men are created equal. And I think most people would accept that. The, the, the question is, what do you take as a political principle? The political principle may not be the same as the scientific truth or the philosophical truth. Because uh, philosophers can never rule on their own. And when they try to rule on their own, usually people take over their philosophy and rule instead of them. I think, yeah, I, 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 yeah I'm thinking of the example of uh, Karl Marx, but, um, but uh, uh, so, uh, but there are others too. So, uh, so you need a political principle, and a, and a political principle is is uh, is one which is mainly true, uh, but has some exceptions to it. And I think the, an example of that would be all men are created equal. Mainly true has some exceptions, and a government has to both represent the main truth and handle the exceptions. So all of the second volume of, of Tocqueville's Democracy in America is about the ways in which we are unequal and how a democracy deals with that. For example, it looks like men and women aren't equal, aren't the same. So, so how does a democracy deal with that? Or it looks like all of us don't have the same degree of uh, intellect. Some have better brains than others. So how does democracy deal with that? And, so, and you can imagine other ways of dealing with it. But in, in general, um, the, the distinction that needs to be made is between what the, the philosophic truth and the political truth. And they're, they're related, but they're not the same. So that's, that's what I would say. In the Chinese context? Yeah. Uh, can I just repeat the question? Okay. Uh, so, some of the Chinese Strauss scholars are trying to use a theory to 
uh, oh, yes, okay. to bring back you know, the traditional value to counterbalance the liberalism. What do you think of this? Counterbalance <laughs> liberalism. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, the, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Dong Zheng Lai is the one I know. Unfortunately, uh, recently died. But, um, so, um, I, uh, for some reason, I don't read them in, in Chinese. Um, so, uh, I can't. I can't. I, I can't say what they say. But um, it would seem to me reasonable uh, because uh, I, don't, I don't think you could look at uh, America. American democracy is maybe a success but I don't think liberalism is. And, the, and the, the reason is that liberalism admits that it is not a success. Liberalism has fallen in, gone from liberalism into postmodern uh, relativism, which says uh, nothing is true or better than anything other, than any, any, any other thing or any other idea or principle. So, so it has, and, and there's no such thing as progress. If you have progress, then you know you're going from something you know is not so good to something that is better. So you have to have some notion of what is better. For that, you need a notion of what is good. And, and liberalism today cannot pronounce on what is good. So for, for that, I think that's one of Strauss's points, and, that, and I think that is correct. And so. You know, so if you can look for some way to balance and to give more weight to liberalism and find it in chi Chinese uh, uh, history or philosophy, then uh, th that's worth that's worth a try. I would say I I, I can't I can't say how how it would succeed.